Welcome to another edition of ATL Prime Sports. I'm JJ Jurjevich. Joining me this evening is the one, the only TC Todd Quarter and our fabulous producer Wayne Ridenauer in beautiful Memphis, Tennessee. You can find us all at ATL Prime Sports on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and of course on Apple and Spotify. Just search ATL Prime Sports on those platforms and you can get right to us. Our personals at JJ Get You One for myself on Twitter, at RWY Junior for Wayne, and at Quarter Todd for TC Todd Quarter. Wayne, how you doing tonight, buddy? Well, I tell you, I'm doing a lot better than Charles Leclerc, who spun and crashed his Formula One Ferrari in front of his home fans at the French Grand Prix while he was leading the race. Ouch, I'm doing pretty good too. Uh, last month, without football for about six plus months so get ready folks todd how you doing buddy i'm doing great uh you know 39 years ago today was when george brett uh was uh called out at the end of the royals yankees game 39 years ago today george brett stormed the dugout and had to be held he was going after one umpire and had to be held back by the other one, and our guest this evening, uh, Warren Brewster, Philadelphia Phillies 1980 World Series champion, played against uh, George Brett in 1980 in the World Series against the Kansas City Royals. Warren will come right up. He'll be our guest momentarily. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Kyle Murray, Julio Jones, the Falcons. And some other things right here on ATL Prime Sports. Let's bring our guest in, 1980 World Series Philadelphia Phillies champion, uh, Warren Brewster, who is going to be seeing Pete Rose, believe it or not. Uh, the Phillies are going to have their World Series team celebration. It'll be the first time since being banned from uh, betting on baseball in 1989 will Pete Rose be part of an on-field celebration for the Phillies. He'll be attending the celebration of the 1980 Phillies World Series team on August 7th at Citizens Bank Park. He spent five years with the Phillies. Warren, wow, what a ball club this was. I, I, I know that you can't wait to get with the guys, Mike Schmidt, Dickie Knowles, Steve Carlton, Larry Boa, Greg Lazinski, Bob Boone, Tug McGraw, to name a few, you have really got to be excited for the 7th of August as you'll be in Philadelphia at Citizens Bank Park uh, with your uh, World Series championship team. And thanks for uh, joining us here on ATL Prime Sports. Well, thank you, Todd. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I have been, uh, this has been in the works for about three or four months now. And uh, now it's getting close to time to uh, head to Philly. And I uh, really look forward to seeing a lot of my old teammates. I haven't seen uh, – I've done fantasy camp for the Phillies, so I've seen Greg Lazinski and Bob Boone and Keith Moore. And I've seen a few of the guys, and Dickie Knowles, Marty Bystrom. I see some of them come in from time to time, Mike Schmidt, Larry Bow. I've seen majority of them uh, there at fantasy camp. So uh, I've stayed in touch with most of them, and uh, through the years we've gotten together from time to time. Wow. I mean, this has got to be so exciting. And the fact that the Larry Boa and, um, uh, you know, said that Pete Rose was coming and the Phillies confirmed it. When's the last time you saw Pete? And are you surprised that he actually is coming? Uh, yeah, I am surprised. I, I think it's great. I think that it's going to uh, really help, you know, him getting back on the field and, and being around the fans and, and seeing how he's uh, received uh, there in Philadelphia. You know, the Philly fans love him. He was the one they, you know, said he was the difference in us winning and being, uh, getting to the playoffs and not being able to win uh, to get to the World Series. And he finally got us to the World Series. In fact, uh, in game six, the clinching game, um, he, he, uh, Bob Boone had a pop-up going in the ninth inning with the bases loaded, pop-up out of his glove, and Pete was underneath him and caught it with, for the second out of the inning. And it was uh, plays like that that, you know, he he was noted for. He he was always in the right spot at the right time because he was he hustled so much. You know, he was 
he was a great teammate. I really enjoyed playing with him. He was a lot of fun to watch. You know, I hated playing against him, but I loved playing with him. You know, he's a, he's a great baseball player. Uh, so it'll be good to see him. The last time I saw him was at a card show probably about 10 years ago. We uh, They brought all the 1980 Phillies in to uh, Philadelphia, and we did a card show together. And that was the last time I saw him. I tell you what, I'm so old, I remember that play that you described with Pete Rose. I, I, I was 15, about to turn 16 when it happened. And that just tells you that time flies, my friend. And, you know, I'm yes. really, <laughs> I mean, I'm really glad you joined us tonight. I, I hadn't heard from you in a while. I traded texts with you frequently and this and that. So. I'm glad you got you really are, are are coming because this is really exciting for you. Oh yeah, it's it's going to be a great time. I'm really looking forward to it, you know. And, and uh long overdue Ron Reed's going to be put on the Willie uh the Phillies uh, Hall of, Wall of Fame. And uh he was uh, very instrumental in in all the years that the Phillies all the success they had to the late 70s early 80s. He was a big part of that bullpen and you know, it was very, very consistent. And he was uh, kind of took me under his wing and showed me the ropes. You know, he's a great man. And I'm, I'm really proud to say I was his teammate. You know, and, uh, in being inducted to the Wall of Fame, he and Bake McBride are going to both be inducted to the Wall of Fame off that 80 team. So uh, I think that just the majority of them are on it now, the, the majority of the everyday players, which they should be because there were a lot of superstars on that team. Listening to Warren Brewster right here on ATL Prime Sports, 1980 World Series champion. Warren, JJ here. Got to ask you, huge baseball fan. I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. You got to ask, what's your opinion on Pete Rose in the Hall I think he's. Yeah, I think at some point he deserves to go in. Yeah, he. Uh, you know, it's a matter of time. He he's got to be in. You know, it's, it, I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know, the state of baseball. It, it really bothers me when the all-time hits leader Pete Rose is not in the Hall of Fame. Barry Bonds, the all-time home run leader, is not in the Hall of Fame. Roger Clemens wins seven Cy Youngs, which I don't think anybody will ever match. And he's not in the Hall of Fame. You know, what's that say about the Hall of Fame? You know, it's the the three statistical leaders in in, in big time categories are not in the Hall of Fame. You know, it's so there's you know it really gives baseball kind of a black eye. It it really bothers me. You know, and I think eventually Pete will go in, but uh, I think it'll take him passing before uh, he gets in. Yeah, and I, I think with the way the game is now and how Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, they're all partnering with the Harrahs of the world, the, the MGM Entertainments, the Caesar Sportsbooks. So why not? If you're partnering with these guys now, let's fix the past, get him in the Hall of Fame. He's one of the best players ever. And that brings me to my follow-up fan question. You've played with so many great players. Uh, name name some of the your favorites that you've played with and maybe some of the favorite memories around those players because there's just too many. I can't ask you who's the best. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that's a question I couldn't answer. Yeah, playing with Mike Schmidt. You know, Schmidt, he played Pepper with the left center field fence or the left field tarp up and up above the left field left center field fence. He was just, he was a phenomenal talent. You know, and fun to watch on a daily basis. You know, he and Greg Luzinski just back to back hit three and four, and and they really carried our offense. And then playing with Steve Carlton, who was the greatest, you know, one of the greatest top five all time left handed pitchers uh, that ever played the game, and probably had the best slider of anybody that ever played the game. Uh, you know, he was fun to watch every fifth day. You know, every fifth day was win day, and. You know, he had some phenomenal games and, and some phenomenal years, you know. And then I was fortunate when I got to play for the uh, Chicago Cubs, getting to play in Wrigley Field for three years and got to play with Fergie Jenkins and watched how he went about his business. And what a great, uh, great guy and a great competitor. And just uh, how he was just a phenomenal talent. You know, I played with Ryan Sandberg. Another phenomenal talent made it look so easy. Just uh, never didn't look like he was making any effort at all. And the game came so easy to him. 
Uh, and a lot of uh, things he did were just unbelievable. Nobody's ever been able to do for uh, a second baseman. He's He was quite a talent. So I was very fortunate to play with uh, a lot of great players. And then, of course, Pete, you know, the all-time hit leader. And nobody hit the ball better than Pete. Nobody had more hits than Pete. And he was fun to watch on a daily basis, just how he went about his business. You know, he never let it up. As soon as he um, hit, if he made an out, he put his helmet down and sat up right on the top step and watched every move. You know, he would say, oh, look at a shortstop. Just moved over two steps. Here comes something in. You know, I just he, – he was so on top of the game that was um, just fun to watch. It was fun being around him, uh, the energy he had and uh, the electricity that, that he just had going with him. He was just a great player, a lot of fun to watch. Hey, um, Warren, I, I, I got to ask you – about the celebration uh, that you're going to be attending. Tell me all about it. What are you going to be doing? How many days are you going to be there? And et cetera. What are the Phillies doing for the fans and and et cetera? Well, I'm flying in on Thursday, so I'm going to get there a day ahead, and it starts on Friday the 5th. Uh, The first night they're going to honor Dan Baker, who's been the uh, voice announcer for the Phillies for well over 50 years. Uh, and they're honoring him that Friday night to start the festivities off for the weekend. Then Saturday night, they're going to have the Wall of Fame inductions of Ron Reed and Bake McBride and all of us, the players on the 80 team, will go down on the field and celebrate with those two players. And then on Sunday, we're having a party at the owner's house after the game, and uh, we'll all be introduced before the game. And I, I'm sure they'll have things for us to do, autograph signings and, and things like that. They generally do that. Uh, it's, it's called Alumni Weekend. They have it the first weekend in August every year. Uh, so there's there's quite a few things, quite a few activities, you know, and, and we'll all be upstairs eating dinner up in the um, Philly offices, up in their their um, box boxes up above the uh, stadium. So it'll be great to see everybody, and uh, we'll get three days together. And then on Monday, we play uh, a golf tournament. We all go out and play golf at the uh, owner's country club. Let me so guess. Be- I was going to say, you'll never have to buy a beer again in Philadelphia. There's just <laughs> no, no. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And Dallas Green always told us that, you know, and that's uh, – uh, the. the uh, Dickie Knowles is a real personal good friend of mine, and uh, whenever we get together, uh, he still works for the Phillies, and the, and dinner or whatever we do, whatever we do, uh, is on the Phillies. Speaking of Phillies, Warren, um, you, you know the alumni weekend. These are important games here with with Atlanta. The three game set, uh, the right. 40, 56, what fifty? I'm saying fifty and forty six. What nine games behind the Mets? Six a loss, Connell behind Atlanta. They beat Atlanta six four last night. Uh, you know, it, it, this is an important three game series with Philadelphia. You know, despite Bryce Harper's injury and you know the firing of Joe Girardi, the hiring of Rob Thompson, uh, the interim manager, they've gone twenty seven and sixteen. Uh, what do you expect uh, GM Dave Dombrowski to do at the trade deadline? They're right there tied with San Francisco. For the for right. hard spot, and, and and Dombrowski being a Tigers fan, I know him well. I know him well in terms of what he does at trading temp time. I expect him to make a move. Oh yeah, definitely. You know they they've got to shore up the pitching. They've got as good an everyday day eight players uh, that play every day, uh, and they have some kids that can uh, they can mix and match uh, their offense. They, you know, they, they've got an outstanding offense, but the pitching's been short. But I think everybody in baseball, you can never have enough pitching. Some of the teams, the Padres, the Dodgers, uh, the Yankees, the Mets have outstanding pitching staffs. You know, the Phillies are a little bit short on the, on the pitching part. They have shored up the bullpen for the most part and finally figured that out a little bit. But uh, I'm sure they're I'm sure they're in the market for a starting pitcher, at least one, either a starter or one more piece in the bullpen. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, I'm sure that's not what everybody, the teams, the main teams that are in contention right now are all looking for pitching. You know, it's that time of year where 
where uh, they see what they need, and everybody always needs pitching. You can never have too much pitching. And I happened to be at the game when Bryce Harper got hit by Blake Snell at oh. uh, in San Diego. <laughs> I was down in San Diego and just happened to go to that game. And, you know, it's that's a problem that the, the Phillies have had all year is every time they get on a roll and win a few games in a row, somebody gets hurt. You know, Segura's been out for oh, six weeks now. Harper's been out for over a month. You know, and I'm sitting here right now watching the uh, Atlanta Philadelphia game. Atlanta's up three nothing in the fourth. Yeah, I've got uh, in the back behind me, behind me to the side. There's two of them in here. I, I think JJ. <laughs> we we all got it on in the background. Oh, okay. We, yep. Now they're in the fifth. <laughs> well, Warren, my, that's actually my yeah. next question. What, what, what do you think the percentage chances of Philadelphia getting back in this NL East race, and uh, who do you have winning the NL East? And uh, give me some of your favorites going into the MLB postseason because it, it's wide open with the uh, expanded playoffs this year. Right, right. And that's what, you know, Atlanta showed in the past last season that you don't have to win the division to win the World Series. You know, and the Miami Marlins are a prime example of that. They've never won an Eastern Division crown, but they've won more of two World Series. Uh, you know, so I, I expect a dogfight. I think Atlanta and the Mets are, are going to go head to head the rest of the season. The Phillies are or a, a distant third, they're going to have to really uh, turn something around and really get something figured out. If you get nine games out, you know, you're I'm sure they're number one hoping for a wild card spot, and that's all that matters. You get in the playoffs, you never know what's going to happen. But it's going to be interesting because of the, the format now that those five and six seeded teams are going to play all their games on the road in that first round. So that'll be uh, interesting to see how that how that comes about. Uh, but I, you know, the Dodgers are going to be tough to beat. They're they're just they've had a phenomenal year, and they're getting pitching out of uh, some guys that haven't really been or not that noted. You know, Kershaw's come back to have a good year, uh, but Goslin and, and Tyler Anderson are two kids that you know I've never had these kind of years that they're having. Uh, it just it's amazing, and they just they just keep winning games, and then you can't count the Padres out. The Padres pitching is they're finally putting everything together. They got Clevenger healthy. Uh, if they can, you know, if Tatis comes back and does anything it, it, near to what he's done in the past, is they're going to be very difficult to beat. You know, there's, they don't, I don't think too many people want to face the Dodgers or the Padres. There's going to be some great playoff series. You know, there's a lot of a lot of teams, a lot of pitching, you know, and that's what's shown this year. The batting averages overall are, are some of the lowest they've had since the mid-60s. It's the year that they lowered the, or lowered the mound. Uh, you know, so pitching's really dominating the game, and you can't have too much pitching. And, and the old adage in baseball is pitching and defense wins championships. So I think everybody that uh, is in contention is going to try to load up and, and find some starting pitchers. And there's four or five uh, real quality pitchers out there that are that are on the market. Hey, uh, Mr. Uh, Brewster, this is uh, Wayne, the producer. Uh, I'm a longtime uh, suffering, I guess, Texas Rangers fan. And um, I, uh, I was wondering, back in the day uh, when you played, they didn't have the interleague play. Uh, is that something no. you would, would have would have enjoyed doing, or are oh, you glad yeah. you didn't? Are you glad you didn't have to go up against uh, Bump Willis, Mickey Rivers, and Jim oh, Sunberg? No. Oh no, I I love facing the best, you know, and that's the one thing in my career. I was briefly uh, the month of September, nineteen eighty two, with the White Sox. So I was in the American League for a month, and I the, the one thing in my career, if I would have, if if I was anything I could have done, it would have been able to play in Fenway, play in Yankee Stadium, play in Detroit, play in the old Cleveland Stadium, and, and play in those ballparks, and and see all the teams and see all the parks in baseball, and and being able to say that I played there, you know, and uh, Texas. You know they they had a lot of you know a lot of talent. Toby Hara, Jim Sundberg, the guys you're talking about. You yeah. know Jim Kern, I played with in uh, Chicago with the White Sox that month. What a talent he was. He he could really bring it. He was a great great reliever. And then Sparky Lyle pitched briefly or for a couple years with Texas. You know so the Texas had a lot of talent. Ferguson Jenkins played there for a number of years. You know they they had a lot of players. They just couldn't the the, the American League. It's a tough, 
tough league when the Yankees go out and buy a lot of talent. You know that in that in those days, the Yankees were were very tough to beat because they get oh, yeah. if they needed a player, they'd go out and buy him, which yeah. a lot of the other teams couldn't do. Right. You know, Warren, you were close to playing the Yankees. Had the Royals not beat them, you would have played them in the '80 World Series. So right, and it's '77 and '78. The Dodgers played the Yankees both years in the World Series, and we we just couldn't get by the Dodgers. There again, their pitching right. was better than ours. That happens. Warren, thanks so much for joining us. Um, let me oh, know Chris, how thank you, Todd. And, and everything. I'll be up in Philadelphia probably, but it won't probably be until the end of August works. So okay. I'll All just right. make it by about three weeks. Yeah, that's too bad. Well, thank Except you for having me on, guys. I really appreciate it. You know, it's a yeah, it'll be really show. cold. I'll be inside a hockey rink. And yet it'll be happy. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, thanks so much for coming on, my sure. friend. Really uh, anytime, Todd. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a great All evening. Right. Thank you. You as Thank well. You. All right. yep. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Warren All Bruce, right. 1980 World Series champion for the Philadelphia Phillies and a friend of mine. And I'm called. I'm happy to call him a friend. I spoke to him when I went to California this year, uh, when I was in Southern California briefly, uh, broadcasting uh, USA Hockey. <clears throat> and uh, he's a really good person. And, and, you know, he helped his wife, guys, helps a lot. We should have mentioned this name. And he didn't mention it, too. And I know he's kicking himself for not mentioning it. You know, his wife does a lot of work for the Tug McGraw Foundation. Tug McGraw was the, you know, big-time Phillies closer, uh, big-time Phillies pitcher on that 80 squad. And, uh, you know, Tug passed away, and his wife does a lot of work for that foundation, and if we'd have had more time, we could have went into it. But I thought that would mention it. And Good questions, guys. Let's move on. Let's go from uh, professional baseball to professional football. And to me, this is an absolute stunner. I shouldn't be stunned um, of what's going on in today's sports world. Uh, the old, I'm probably more stunned than you since I'm older than you, J.J. Wayne. You're probably as equally as stunned as I am with this. Do you see these eyes? These yeah. These are my stunned eyes. <laughs> all right. Well, let's, let's, let's go ahead and be all stunned together. You know, Colin Early signed the $230 million uh, contract with the Arizona Cardinals. And they may, in the contract, in the clause, I said it to you guys today, they made him agree to four hours a week, which is about 40 minutes a day of independent film study. How, you know, how can you justify this contract if you have to beg them to do the minimum to watch film? This is a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, I'll let, I'm going to let you go first, Wayne. I want to hear what you got to say since you're around my age, and we'll sandwich JJ in between us. I don't know. You know, I, I may, maybe it's something they know about him that we don't know, or they just want him to be uh, more focused. But to me, it seems like if he knows the playbook, then you know, uh, why is he having to watch the film? Just tell him what play to run and let him go. It's pretty simple, JJ. You know, I, I, I'm I'm baffled by this. Uh, you read the contract, and it, if you have to put a clause in there for the four hours of independent study during game week, and within that four hours, it cannot be on an iPad tablet, you can't be playing video games, you can't surf the internet. These are actual terms that are in the contract. If you have to give a guy $230 million and that's how you have to, you have to contractually get him into the building to study, that's a big question mark to give him that much money. It really is. What, what kind of, uh, I mean, just imagine, uh, and I'm just thinking outside the box, look, looking at this contract, it would tell me this guy doesn't do the film study, right? Can we all agree on that? So. You have to motivate them to get him in there. Just imagine, if this does work, how much better of a player he could be if he puts down the video games and the the tablets and the 
surfing the web. Uh, and it's just appalling. Again, I can't believe it's actually worded in an NFL contract. Kirby Smart went on an interview. I think it may have been SEC Media Days or 680 here locally. I can't remember where the interview was, but he was telling them, you have to get these guys in 30 seconds. You can't you can't stray away from a 30-minute, 20-minute talk anymore. It's got to be within 30 seconds to keep them engaged. And if they're not engaged, that's it. So it, it's tough. And that's what these coaches uh, in the NFL and college, they're all dealing with. And this contract proves it. This is absolutely crazy. An extremely talented player. And it's being brought to light that if, if he just studies the bare minimum, they're thinking he can be that good. Well, Boy, he, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Wayne. Go ahead. What, I, you know, I, I, I almost hesitate to do something like that if I were the coach or whoever arranged this agreement because I feel like you, in some ways you're taking this guy out of his normal groove and making him do something that's not, you know, that he doesn't normally do. And there's a chance this actually may make him a worse player. Yeah, it could backfire. Uh, you just can't make this stuff up. You can't. I read the contract like you did, JJ, and I read it twice. I, I I just couldn't believe it. That tells me you shouldn't have signed him. That's what that tells me, to that kind of money. And before they signed him, he was disgruntled because he wasn't getting the money. You know, he went to social media. He went to... the. Uh, the, the media, and he was disgruntled. He may leave. Look, Kyler's a hell of an athlete. He had a shot to play pro baseball. You know if you're playing each sport, you're well, a break. say the same thing. But $230 million? I'm sorry. Arizona overpaid for him, and this to me is an intention getter, and I would have never, ever, ever gone to great lengths to sign somebody to a contract like this with all these stipulations, this to me is bat crazy. Yeah, but this ain't this ain't Oklahoma, this ain't Oklahoma, this Arizona, this is the NFL. So I don't know why they treat is, him like that. It is it's just, like this is crazy. It, it's a crazy world. It, it and, is no way I'm the GM. I'm doing that. And I'll tell you what, if Kyler if he doesn't play well. Not only and Kyler's going to get his money, the GM's going to lose his job. I mean, and, and Kyler's agent, he's a big winner of the day, too. He's getting a percentage of his contract. And, the, you know, the Cardinals management, they'll fire this GM. Now that this has got out in writing, and they'll fire him if he doesn't play well. And not only is signing his contract to, you know, how in the heck are you going to build the rest of the football team Signing this guy in. Everybody says the cap experts say you can do this in 10. But I haven't seen a team win the Super Bowl yet. Or get to the Super Bowl with a quarterback making this kind of money now. Obviously, the Chiefs have a shot with, with their quarterback situation. But their offensive line, uh, Mahomes is going to run for his money. Let's go to the next subject. Speaking of bargain hunting. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers signed former Falcons great Julio Jones to a one-year deal. And guess what? This can go two ways. I'm going to get it out right now. I said it on Twitter, at Quarter Todd, C-O-R-D-E-R-T-O-D-D. It's going to go to two ways. Either he's going to be a star like he was with the Falcons, or he's going to stay injured like he was with the Titans. This is not a financial risk for Tampa. He gets to play with a goat. To me, this this is a no-brainer to, to make this kind of move, especially for the money they're signing him. He's going to play with four other outstanding receivers. To me, the chances are if he stays healthy, this is a hell of a deal, and it could put Tampa's offense into the Super Bowl. JJ? I'm with you. Todd, I agree with you 100%. It's going to be either really good or really bad, in my opinion. I think the team will still be really good, but I'm just talking about in terms of Julio Jones and his performance. It's either going to go really good or really bad. Here's why. I'll break it down. He missed seven games last year with Tennessee. The year prior, seven games in 2020 with Atlanta. Four times in his career, he's only played a full season. Um, that's the one way. You see where I'm going with this. Injury-riddled season. He's not play. playing. 17 or, or he plays in 13 to 15 ball games and 
he's paired with another great quarterback. He's got 55 career touchdowns, and you see where I'm going with that. It's a health or not issue, and Todd, we're, we, we agree. I'm not going to repeat the exact same things because I would literally say the exact same things. It's a matter of, look, Chris Godwin's there. Kyle Rudolph's there now. Mike Evans is there now. Uh, I think Connor Brait is still one of, uh, another tight end to back up Rudolph. You have plenty of offensive firepower there. Fournette's still there. Uh, and, and it's Tom Brady, folks. Uh, we already know about the defense, one of the best in the league. So I, I think this is going to go very well for the Bucks. But just like Todd said, it's either here or here for Julio Jones' season. He won't play 17 games. The odds no are low. That's why I said I say 13 to 15, and that's a win for the Bucks. If he plays 12 games, it's a win. Uh, what do you think, Wayne? Well, yeah, Julio Jones kind of reminds me of a, a, a used uh, Chevy Camaro. I mean, there's a chance that it's going to go really fast and be the coolest car you've ever had, or you're going to be constantly be having to fix it, and it's going to be parked in the garage. So we'll see. Do you think he's going to come back to haunt the Atlanta Falcons now based upon I've seen the Falcons' history? Yeah. No. And do no. something really good again on him. I no. think. You don't think so, uh, Wayne? No, I think Falcons are going to beat Tampa Bay two times uh, this upcoming season. The only team they're going to lose twice to is going to be uh, the Saints. you got that state dinner coming if it happens, brother. I, I promise you that. I can absolutely, unequivocally, me and JJ will take care of that. I don't think. Oh, oh that gets me excited. <laughs> I hope that happens. <laughs> no chance and you know what. The bet's going to happen, but I love that you put it out there. I really do. Let's go on to the speaking of those Falcons. Yeah, speaking of the Falcons, thank you very much. Um, wow. I mean, this is uh, we're going to talk about during training camp. This competition. I I'm just going to say it, and you guys can fill it in. To me, you know, we talked about the comp. You're going to talk about competitions and positions, but to me, this is a team that has more positions up for grabs, the Falcons, than any team in the National Football League. Outside Jake Matthews, the offensive tackle, tight end Kyler Pitts, wide receiver Drake London, guard Chris Lindstrom, and a corners A.J. Trell and Casey Hayward. Oh, and defensive tackle Grady Jarrett, and the kicker Koo, all right, running back wide receiver Patterson. After that, may the best man win. There are so many, there's so much competition out there. The coaches are really going to have a good time in training camp. Uh, yeah, you go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, you, you mentioned it. There, you can go linebacker. You could go center. Uh, speaking of linebacker, Deion Jones was uh, recently placed on the pup list, physically able, uh, unable to perform. So that's going to be, uh, a question mark: Do the Falcons move on from him? Does he even play in the Falcons uh, in the Falcons uniform again? He's got a big contract. Uh, the competition there would be uh, Walker, who had 17 tackles and an INT last year, and Rashad Evans, who uh, played at Alabama, of course, and had uh, four good years with Tennessee, and uh, Lorenzo Carter, and then uh, Troy Anderson was was drafted as well. So there, there's some competition there. Another one I'm looking forward to is the battle at center, TC. Uh, this is one of the few positions on the offensive line that is up for grabs, and it's versus Drew Dowman and Matt Hennessy, both drafted in the last two years consecutively. Uh, both guys are about the same height, 6'3", 300, right in that range. And ever since the departure of Alex Mack, the Falcons have been searching for that center. They didn't bring in a free agent. They didn't draft any centers. So it's between these two guys, and I'm excited to see which one comes out and hopefully solidifies that center position for the Atlanta Falcons. You mentioned the contract from Deion Jones. This really hinders the chances of him being hurt and the club can trade him. The contract is unattainable. Dead money, $24.9 million in the contract. <laughs> Boy, if they can trade him or get somebody to take um, half of the contract or something, it would give them cap room for the future. I mean, this contract is an albatross around the Falcons' brass neck. Well, One of the I, lingering I, ones from previous regimen, uh, Dimitrov and Quinn. So uh, that that is literally 
And, and then we all mentioned in name earlier the other one. They're still, they're st I don't, they're still so paying some of Julio's salary to play against them. So yeah, great. You'll score against them. Oh, by the way, we're so still so this is a team time. salary cap stricken and uh, position battles of plenty. Is the is the it's the news from training camp. Who wants to play? Where do you want to play? <laughs> Biggest news of camp, and it's not close. Wayne, do you have any? Uh, you, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, to me, competition, this uh, you know, preseason for positions only improves everybody because everybody's trying harder to get in those positions. When you have a team that's locked in and you know who the starters are, I think those guys get lazy, and so uh, I look for this to be a team improvement. I like the take. It, it's but it's got logic behind it. Well, look, linebacker Nate Landman, he was undrafted rookie from Colorado. He can make the roster to me. And, and on the Falcons also rave over rookie Troy Anderson, the second round pick from Montana State. Uh, these are two players to watch out for camp. We haven't mentioned them. You know what? These guys, Anderson can start. And Landman can get a spot, special teams, come in for some plays on linebacker. But you know what, guys? The biggest story of all, and you haven't mentioned it yet. You mentioned it before on the podcast when I haven't been around. But to me, I'm, I'm looking for the quarterback position between Desmond Ritter, the third rounder out of Cincinnati, and Marcus Mariota, who signed a two-year cap-friendly contract. And, you know, he's got a relationship with Coach Arthur Smith in Tennessee. And to me, like J.J. has said many times, if Mariota can turn into Mariota to Tennessee in the playoffs, and what year was that? 2016, 17? 16 or 17, yep. Thank you. Then, you know, the Falcons have something here. But if he's not and he's injured and Desmond Ritter comes out, he ends up being the franchise quarterback. For $5 million, you can build a competitor in a few seasons. That would be, the, to me, a Ritter would be the dream scenario because he's young and you would have a veteran backup in Mariota. Uh, that would be the dream scenario. We'll see how it plays out. I'm thinking Ritter's going to play this year eventually, that Ritter, you know, that, that Mariota is going to get hurt, especially with the weakness of the offensive line. But that's the story of camp. And, how it all started is when the Falcons wanted the Sean Watson guys, and you know, with the trade talks, and then they end up trading Matt Ryan. And now I hear at quarterback five teams, Falcons are one of them, that are interested in getting Jimmy G. But why would you put yourself back in cap hell if you're just trying to get out of it? That makes no sense to me, unless the 49ers are willing to eat a lot of money. If they are, then you bring in more competition in camp. So, you know, this is really interesting to me. This is, it's not a boring team. I saw it a day when the uh, uh, USA Today predicted where each team would finish in the record. They picked the Falcons with the worst record in the NFL at 2-15. and 15. Look, I'm going to let Wayne comment on that one. We already know what he's going to say. <laughs> well, here's what I'm going to say. Uh, Marcus Mariota. Combined with uh, Arthur Smith is going to equal a whole lot of these. And you know what those are? First what? downs. First downs. I'm going to predict that Atlanta is one of the top teams for first downs per game, and that's what's going to win games. Well, first downs do win games. J.D., I don't know what to say after that. I'm glad I'm sitting down. <laughs> hey, you know, I love what Wayne's uh, f fanism is there. It's great because – Again, I mentioned this. I'll mention it every time. Ever since he called, they're not losing until the Super Bowl. I listen. I just listen to Wayne's takes. Because they, 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 they did not, but they got there, and that was impressive enough. No, that was the same year. I know. Realistically, though, uh, Marcus Mariota is going to be running for his life, and he's if he's able to use his feet to extend plays, get to Kyle Pitts, and if and if London has a good rookie year, things can go right for Atlanta. It's an NFL franchise, and and uh, and I'll use the Cincinnati Bengals as a prior example. 
Joe Burrow goes down, they win four games. Joe Burrow comes back, they win ten games and win the AFC. So and, anything and, can happen in the NFL, folks. And that's a good point because Joe Burrow got sacked more than any quarterback in the NFL last year, ran for his life in the Super Bowl, including the playoffs, and somehow got there. The odds are long that the Bengals will get back. They have improved that offense line, so if they have, that will increase their chances. But in this league, it's just too competitive. It, it's it, too close. You know, will they get back? I like the Rams' chances because of the defense. I like the 49ers because of their defense. Those are the two best defenses along with Tampa Bay in the NFC. So they're the top three teams. I don't care how you shake it. Oh, speaking of the 49ers, they named um, they named Trey Lance their starting quarterback today, guys. They so did. They're going to trade Jimmy G if they can. I'm telling you what, why would you do that without having, I mean, to me, you're just playing your hand, Wayne and JJ. You're playing your hand. I, I wouldn't have announced him starting quarterback. I, I would have played out a battle uh, all the way through the end of training camp, even into preseason, uh, if you're doing it that way. But obviously, they're moving with the young guy first, uh, more ability to get outside of the pocket. That's the new NFL. It's extending it plays and, 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 and finding receivers, back shoulder passes. It's about getting outside the pocket and moving it. It is. That's what Trey Lance is best at. Well, guys, unless you got any, you know, it's time to go. Before we go, it'll be my 31st wedding anniversary tomorrow. Yes, I'm going on vacation Friday. Yes, I will not be on next week. Yes, you'll probably have Dave Cohen on next week because it's uh, Sun Belt Media Day in New Orleans today. I was in SIAC Media Day, which is not is not like the Sun Belt Media Day, but I was down at the College Football Hall of Fame, which is the same place where the SEC Media Day was. So that's really cool. If anyone's never had a chance to go to the College Football Hall of Fame, I didn't see a ton of it. I was there for work, but. Um, uh, you know, that was really cool. And you guys will be able to talk to Dave. Hopefully you can get him on next week and uh, talk him about it because um, coaches say things in media days. The SIAC coaches said things uh, that will surprise you. And, uh, you know, today it's more of a bold world. You want to say something about your coach, the other team's coaching the opponent, that's the place to do it. And my final thought on the show this evening has to do with a ridiculous estimation by Chicago City Mayor Lori Lightfoot. The Bears might be getting a dome over Soldier Field. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot revealed three proposals for renovations. Oh, to Soldier Field. And, and, and here's the here's the crazy thing: the the, the range is from nine hundred million to two point two billion dollars. That's that's a lot of difference. But I don't think the fans will want a dome stadium in Chicago. They love the weather. They love the elements. And that's part of Soldier Field. So I personally think this will get moved to the Burbs. And uh, that'll be that. Wayne, what's your final thought on the show, buddy? Well, as far as that dome goes, I wish they'd put a dome over Memphis so we could air condition the whole city because it's too hot. Hey, and speaking of a dome, there's not a ghost chance in Gale, Sarah, hell. Mike Dicka, Jim McMahon, Walter Payton, hell, that the Bears are putting a dome above their stadium in Never. Chicago. Never. It's not. It's a waste of paper. The proposal's a waste of paper. Arlington Heights, I believe, is the name of the city where the bird they're going to in Illinois. And let me tell you, the Maskies, they don't have the financial wherewithal of the other owners in the league. But this with this new stadium, they're going to catch up and make some strides. But, you know, we'll see what the Bears do. You know, it's, it's different in the NFL. I mean, it's different in Major League Baseball than it is in the NFL, the NBA, and hockey. Those three sports I mentioned have a cap. In baseball, there's no cap. There's a luxury tax, and it's just – Different, but hey, get new stadium, new revenue. You can kick. There is one advantage to that. 
you can kick the money can down the road a la Bobby Bonilla and the New York Mets. So you can pay guys down the road if you like. It does hurt a little bit. You know, it does hurt against the cap, but you can do it. Well, that about well, wraps us up, folks. That's, that's up, guys. I'll miss you next week. No, I won't. I'll be on vacation. So I'll be, I'll be uh, with my... Uh, with my wife and I on our 31st wedding anniversary. And I'm really looking forward to it. Wayne, if I get through your neck of the woods, there's a possibility I may go to Oklahoma in September. We'll see. I will definitely stop by with my beautiful bride and meet you and your family. Well, guys, oh. that about wraps up ATL Prime Sports. Yep. If you like the content, give us a thumbs up. Give us a follow. Give us a review on Apple or Spotify. For Wayne, for TC, I'm JJ. Get you one.